back of my head? One for me and one for um, you. Okay, uh, by way of introduction, this is Terry Christopher. Uh, he's CEO of Custom Signals. It's the only place I know in the United States where you can get uh, really prototypical signals for your layout. So I, I met Terry, I think it was uh, five, six years ago. He, he goes to the Big E in Springfield, has a massive setup there. And he, and he was trying to explain to me what I, was, what I needed to do for signaling. So I thought it would be a great idea to have him you know, get with us as a seminar to bring us up to speed on what is signaling, what do you use it for, and then how do you apply it to your layout. Good. Terry? Thank you. This is uh, basically a two-part thing that I do with train shows, normally conventions and things like that. The first part will be railroad signaling. Now, some of you may be very knowledgeable about sig signaling. Some of you may have no idea what it is. But uh, when we get done, you'll have a good idea of enough signaling to know what you can do on your layout. And then the second part, we'll take an intermission, the second part will be how do I take this signaling and put it on my layout? What do I need to do? So I'm going to go through this quickly. First of all, different types of signals. A lot of people aren't familiar with the different types. You've seen, probably seen this around in the Northeast. It's a circular background with the three signals in it. It's called the G signal. It was originally developed by the New York Central to be used from Buffalo to Chicago. You still find them on that line. Mm -hmm. uh, you also find them a lot of different places now. I have them down by me in the uh, Minnesota uh, Valley and uh, even in, in Springfield and a lot of other places still have a G signal there. <clears throat> by the way, we've done a, a line of G signals. That was our first production. They're back in there. You can see them. Uh, the D signal. Can anybody see this? Sorry. Mm -hmm. The D signal is the vertical type. Uh, commonly used by CSX, uh, Southern Railway, these are Southern, Southern Railway signals, um, even Norfolk Southern use them in some locations, but they, these are the D-style signals. These are the searchlights. Again, a round background, but this time you only have one lens, and all three colors come out of one lens. Uh, we again have a full range of searchlight signals back there. That can display the different colors. These are used on a lot of different railroads it's in the, uh, up here in Maine. I've seen them up here in Maine and in uh, Massachusetts in that area. Uh, I talked to a guy in Michigan, worked for the railroad in Michigan. He, uh, he was a signal maintainer up there. He said they had 6,600 searchlight signals up in the state of Maine on the railroads up there. And every one, that's the problem with searchlights and why they're getting rid of them, every one of these has to be checked every six months. The other signals, because they don't have the mechanical parts in them, they don't have to be checked. But these are these are on their way out in a lot of different places. So they change the color by moving something. There's actually a pendulum in there. Okay. So when the pendulum is down, it's red. Okay. That's a, a fail safe. So if the electric goes out or something happens with a mechanical problem, it drops. Then gravity forces are red on it. Otherwise, it's pulled to one side for green and pulled the other side for yellow. So that's how that works. Kind of like what what causes a a railroad to select one or the other or combos. Is it the sales guys or could be? I know. I know. I, 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 don't know that much. I mean, the Pennsylvania had their style signal, yeah. which was the, uh, the the position light signal. So now we have three different lenses, all yellow, and it's the direction of the lenses that determine the aspect. So a vertical would be clear, a horizontal would be stop, and the diagonal would be approach. Uh, considered to be the safest signal ever made. Uh, one, because of the yellow, has a fog penetrating ability to it, so you can see it better in fog. And the other is if one of the lights go out, you still have two that will tell you what the aspect is. Norfolk Southern, Norfolk Western in the early days took something like that, but in this case it was a color position signal. So they had the positions also, but they also used color lenses. So the top and the bottom would be green, the left and the right would be red, and then the diagonals would be yellow. So that was called a color position light signal. It was used on the B&O, and it was also used on uh, the Northeast Quarter. Let me find those. Hmm? No, it says the color position. Oh, there's no letter yeah. for no. They call this a CPL, CPL, color position light. So it, it's basically the Pennsylvania one with the colors 
right? Correct. The only difference is it doesn't have a center light on it. And then there are different styles of dwarf signals. Uh, the advantage of a dwarf signal is a dwarf signal automatically means slow speed. So wherever you see a dwarf, it's going to mean a slow speed signal. So instead of having to build a big signal with three targets on it to illustrate it's a slow speed, you can just put a dwarf there and it's automatically a slow speed. So dwarfs are going to be used in slow speed territory, on yards, uh, sometimes exits to passing sidings, places where they want to slow speed. Uh, you're not going to find a dwarf out on the main line, used as a main line signal. Uh, exceptions, of course. <coughs> the New York Central used dwarfs when you crossed over from track two, opposing traffic on track three. They would have a double, double headed dwarf to use that. But there were exceptions to that, but generally that's where the, you find a dwarf signal. Red and yellow. No, you red, yellow, green. 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 It's interesting. South Station, they have that exact uh, signal, but it's yellow. Uh, I don't know why. It's always yellow. Always. Mm -hmm. Don't get the building. Okay. Get the resuscitators out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, if you look up the NORAC, <clears throat> North American Railroad Signaling Something Something, you'll, give, you'll get this as for signal aspects. All the different color, different signals, different aspects. Uh, very difficult to understand, so we're, we're going to take this and tear this apart a little bit and see if we can make a little more sense out of it. Let's first of all look at color light signals. Now, not all the aspects are here, but generally this is what you can worry about while you have a, a model railroad. Um, you'll see that this has a green in the top. The green in the top position is the clear position at normal speed. The general rule of thumb is this. If the green is in the top, it's normal speed. If it's in the middle, it's either limited or medium speed. And if the green is at the bottom, it's slow speed. All the reds that you see here are simply placeholders. They're telling you which target to look at. So if I have a green on the top, it's clear, normal track speed. If I have a flashing green in the middle, it's, it's limited clear, which means for freight it would be 40, passenger 45. If I have a steady green in the middle, it's medium clear, 30 miles an hour, freight passenger. And if I have a green on the bottom, it's slow speed. That's 15 miles an hour. So if you look at your different track conditions and what the speed would be for that particular track condition, that pretty much determines what signal you would use in that location. Now, if we put a yellow in that position, then this is approach. A flashing yellow is considered to be an advanced approach. So if you had a stop, approach, and then the signal before that would be an advanced approach, two signals before the stop position. Down here, it's a medium approach. This is where it gets a little complicated. The red over the flashing yellow is a medium approach, or red over yellow over red is a medium approach. And then when you get down here at the bottom, again, the lowest target, the third one down, is slow. So now this becomes a slow approach. All of these uh, slow approaches, are they 15 miles per hour across yes. the board? Yes. Okay. All slow speeds are Nothing 15 miles lower than that. What's that? Nothing any lower than that, as far as your low speed. No. Uh, yard limits. Unless you, okay. If you're in a yard, a yard limit, sometimes it's 10. Now, if we take, let's ignore that one. If we put the yellow on the top and another color below it, then we have a signal that's going to be named as an approach signal. So if we have a yellow over flashing green, it's an approach limited. If we have a yellow over steady green, it's approach medium. And if we have a yellow over yellow over yellow over red over green, it's going to be approach slow. Now, the only thing I want you to get out of that is if I put a yellow on the top with another color down here besides red, it becomes an approach, which means you're going, you're now approaching an area where you have to slow down. So you don't have to slow down at that particular thing, but you're approaching an area where you have to slow down. So by the time you get to the next signal, you're going to be going a little bit slower. And that's what you just tried to explain. So slow approach and approach slow. And reverse the words. 
Slow approach. Slow approach. Proceed. Prepare to stop at the next signal. Slow speed applies until I can't read. It. The entire uh, train clears all the interlocking switches and so forth. So slow approach. Proceed. Ready to stop at the next signal. Okay. okay. Approach slow. <clears throat> okay. Where are we here? Approach slow. Approach slow. Approach slow. Approach slow. <laughs> Easier to figure out the number. I notice these are all rules. These are all rules. Approach slow, it's right 284. 284? Okay. Got it. Right where you think it. Okay. Up. Uh, keep going right. Yep. One Approach more. slow. Yep. Proceed approaching the next signal at slow speed. Trains exceeding medium speed must slow down to that slow speed. Uh, you know, for model railroading, you know, do we have to go through all that? Maybe Just not. slow down. So, so, but, Relationship of the words, exactly. And not say them backwards. It's like Latin. It's yeah. like Latin. You go saying them backwards, you can cause a bad situation. Just because you turn two words. Around. But the thing that, that's cool about this is looking at these conditions. You have to ask yourself with a area of track in your layout, do I have any of these well, conditions? Well, yeah. When you go to mock them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, no, that's where I can. I have no idea these ex conditions exist. <laughs> These are the PRR aspects. Again, same, same, same indications here. Uh, the aspects look a little different. By the way, aspects are what you see. When you look at the signal, you see in green, yellow, red, those, that's an aspect. Okay? The, the indication is the name of that particular aspect, and the rule is the direction that you have to follow because of that indication. So aspect, indication, rule. So does it make any difference if it looks like a domino or if it's a circle? Uh, the dominoes are the double-headed dwarfs. That's what Pennsylvania used for their double-headed dwarfs. And the arc, the arch ones were the single-headed dwarfs. They used. So, so, Terry, why is it that, you know, you take a walk like uh, I was walking down the railroad near Saco the other day, and you can't see red, green, yellow, or anything on these signals. They're just, no, they're off. Uh, it's called cool. approach lighting. We'll get into that a little later. <coughs> And there's some other things here. Yeah, so, yeah. uh, before I can do some of this, I just have to do a, a little explanation of layout design. When we do a layout design, this would be just mm -hmm. a standard passing side. Uh, the first thing I do is to find out where the control points or signal points are going to be and then break that up into block numbers. So this would be signal block 12, signal block 13, 14, and 15. Okay. Once I have the block numbers, then I use circles to represent the signals. And then I can assign these targets numbers based on those particular block numbers. So if this is an eastbound train going from left to right, uh, block the target 14E is the signal protecting block 14 from an eastbound train. 13E is protecting block 13 from an eastbound train. 12 West is protecting block from a westbound train. 12 west diverting is also protecting block 12 from a diverting route going westbound. So I'm using these codes, and just give you an idea what, what they're doing, to label my target numbers. I'll do more of this in the second session when I was doing the planning, but uh, you need to know this basically. What you're numbering the one you're protecting. Correct. Not the one you're sitting on when you look at it. That's correct. If I'm sitting in the locomotive, I'm sitting maybe in block 13, 
Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at 12 because that's the track that's. You're looking at a signal that's protecting block 12, correct? That's how it works. So the two, mm -hmm. the two balls that you have there are the aspects, right? The two are targets. <laughs> the targets, okay. Yes. You know, some, signal, mm -hmm. some signals use a double target for an absolute stop, uh, stop. Uh, particularly the G signals. Uh, some other signal manufacturers don't use a double target for an absolute stop, like searchlight signals. They usually use just one. So that's why you have the red, the fixed red light here. But I'll get into that later in a second. Is that a siding over there or is that another track, 13? That's a passing siding. Okay. Yeah. So I guess it goes without saying that the engineer's on the right and the target's always on the right. Correct. Uh -huh. The third thing I do is label the turnouts. It's important to be able to label the turnouts when doing a signal system too. So we have the block numbers, the target numbers, and the turnout numbers or letters either way. different things in railroad signaling. First is called automatic block signaling. Automatic block signaling is where you have one or more trains traveling in the same direction on the same track. And what automatic block signaling does is it separates the train so that one train doesn't rear end another train. So if I were to illustrate automatic block signaling, the train here heading westbound is in block 5. So 5W is red, and 5E is red, because the train is occupying block 5. 4E would be yellow, because it's approaching a red signal. If I had a 6, 6 W down here, that would also be yellow. As the train moves down the track, <coughs> automatic block signaling is going to change these signals to keep the next train from hitting this train. And most systems will work bi-directionally. This system works bi-directionally. So because the train is in block 4, 4E is red, block 4 is occupied. 3E is yellow because the next signal is red. And 2E is green because the train is two blocks away. Now if somebody ran through that, is that supposed to be picked up in, the, in a main tower someplace if this was in real life? If somebody ran, did went, through through, red. went through a red, is that on a, a master chart someplace? In a, there, there, it, it, it's, it's very, very, very complex. There are, I've seen train uh, things where if they pass a red signal, there's a magnet underneath there, which will pull down something on the train, which actually automatically stops the train if it goes through a red target. There's a lot of different things. Uh, if it goes through that, the, the engineer gets a, a, a buzzing sound or noise in the cab, and all kinds of things happen. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. But the dispatcher really can't stop the train. So that's it. But the, the train may stop automatically. So, so it's very interesting. So what I'm looking at here is, so when you're putting, if you're doing a, you have a bite, you can run trains both ways. Oh, we're not there yet. <laughs> we're not there yet. It's, it's just doing automatic block signal. Because what this is kind of telling me is that I've got to have a, a target looking one way and a target looking the other way if I'm running a train. They're Basically, you, you, you're going to, if you're running bi-directionally, yeah, you should have targets running both, targets facing both ways, correct. Okay. Now, if the train were going in the other direction, basically the same thing would happen. And, and just the, the signals would work the same way. Okay? So it's protecting either way. So as the train moves down the track, from block 5 to block 4 to block 3 to block 2, the signals change as the train moves down the track. This is pretty much like you did when we were a kid. And then, you know, Leo Lionel say go in red, and then went out of the block, oh, we got a yellow now. So and then it goes green. So it's called automatic block signal. You hear that term. Now the railroads also go and try to save maintenance of replacing bulbs 
and power and everything else. And they use a system of what's called approach lighting. Now this is the same as your automatic block signaling. The only difference is the signals aren't going to stay on all the time. The signals are only going to be on when the train occupies a block that that particular signal faces. So if this train is in block 5 and 6E is facing block 5 and 4W is facing block 5, then these two signals will be lit, but all the rest of the, rest of the signals will be dark. And this is why sometimes you look down the track and you see a signal, but there's nothing on because it's waiting for the signal the train to approach. As the train spans two blocks, block 5 and block 4, then the signals in block 5 facing block 5 and the signals in facing block 4 will all light up. And as it moves down the track, the signals will also change accordingly. <clears throat> now the system we developed does have approach lighting. You have an approach lighting option on the board. What you can do is put a jumper on and it'll put that signal automatically into approach lighting. So the only time it'll light up is when the train comes into the block in front of it. So in order to light signal, let's call it signal 3W, okay, 4W is going to be, block 4 is going to be occupied. So signal 4W is going to send information up to signal 3W and tell it to light up. That's how it works. Really basic question. <clears throat> is, is there electrical connection in the track that controls all this? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a lot more sophisticated than what we're doing here. It's actually you sine waves, cosine waves, all the different kinds of functions are in there. But the basically, it's because the train itself is making an electrical connection. Correct, between the just rails. like we do. Exactly. The only difference is that this is set up to. Uh, oh, I guess was, this is set up to be active, and what the train does is it shunts out the the uh, electrical connection. So the, the electrical connection is active and then it grounds it out and shunts it out. So if, uh, let's say, a car were to overturn on the tracks and it were connecting the two outside rails on the tracks, it would actually activate this. So if some steel is activated, even though the train's not there, it will still activate. Um, if you need to, if something happens, you have an accident and you want to try to set a signal, you could actually take a set of jumper cables and connect the two rails. It will set the signals red so the train coming down the track will stop. So you can do that. Shouldn't tell you that, but that's what you, know, you can do. It. Now, if you get to a, a grade crossing signal, they're very sophisticated. What they're doing is they're actually measuring the impedance going down the track. Now, impedance is a summation of all the resistances that you find in that track. And they measure that impedance with a computer, and as the impedance changes, they read that change of impedance. So the resistance becomes less and less and less as the train approaches. So they can tell the speed of the train and how far away the train is, and that tells it when to activate the crossing signals. Very, very simple. Very, very complicated, but it works. So we have automatic block signaling, and we have approach lighting. kids, not all of our trains travel in the same direction, follow each other or on different tracks. Occasionally we have trains that oppose each other or cross each other or need to pass each other. And then we get into what's called absolute permissive block signaling. So we had automatic block signaling for one train following another train, and now we have absolute permissive block signaling for trains opposing each other. Now, these are intermediate signals. We have a main line and passing siding here on the left and a main line and passing siding on the right. Notice that at these particular points, these are called control points, we'll have multiple target signals here, two or three target signals, because we need to indicate different speeds. I think we'll <coughs> slide journey here.
the railroad uses different switches. And you can tell the number of a switch by measuring the length on the rail, the straight rail, to a point where you're one foot apart. If you're going 24 feet up before the two rails are one feet apart, you have a 24, number 24 switch. If you go up 15 feet, then you have a number 15, so whether it's 14 or 16. That will tell you the number of the switch and how, uh, how, how much of a curve you have in the switch. I mean, Ross makes uh, number fours, number sixes, number eight switches. The railroad uses like number 24s, 28s, they're really way up there. So, uh, they're very, very long switches. We don't have the room on our layouts to uh, use things like that. Well, we could, but. As the number of the switch changes, the higher it gets, the faster the train can pass through it. Now these are our A, R, E, F, A standards. In a number 5 switch, the train can go through at 12 miles an hour. In a number 10 switch, it can travel through at 21 miles an hour. You get up to a number 16 switch, it can travel through at, oh, I can't see it. 38. 38 miles an hour. So as the switch becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, the train can pass through that switch at a faster speed. Okay. Now, this is why we need double-headed signals at switches. So we can regulate the speed of the train passing through that switch. So if both of my switches are set for the main line, then I'm going to have a clear indication all the way down. And I'd have a clear indication all the way back. But I have reds on the passing sidings. If I change this to the passing siding, then this becomes a medium clear, red over green, 30 miles an hour into the passing siding. And this becomes a medium clear out, 30 miles an hour out. Now I can go back and determine what size switch I would have to put there in order to get a medium speed. Model railroading, we don't need to do that. We just, you know, just use a green over red, red over green. So. Same thing over here. If this changes, and this becomes the passing siding, this becomes the straight route, then this would be a red over green for medium clear, red over green for medium clear to go into the siding and red over red for the main line, because this train coming here is working against that switch. So we're going to be using double-headed signals at our turnouts to indicate speed changes, because in North America our signaling system is based on speed changes. So give us a speed change for going into the side. Anybody have any questions? If I had an option here where I had a medium speed allowed, but I also had, let's say, a, a diverting route or a, a going into a yard or something, then I could use a triple target signal here for the clear for the main, medium for the siding, and slow speed to go into some other area there. And that would be the use of a triple target signal. comes in from the right, westbound, it's in the passing side. It's a double red here now because the switch is set for this direction and that block is occupied. So it's no longer a red over green, but it's a red over red because that's occupied. The train comes out on the main. This now becomes red over red because block five is occupied. This goes back to red over green because the siding is clear.
comes down to here. These are all cleared out. In this area right here, the intermediate area, my intermediate signals are just doing automatic block signaling. Block 3 is occupied, this is a yellow, and then this would be a clear. So within this area here, I have automatic block signal. This goes on to the siding. Nothing really different. The only thing I'm using is the siding to show under different signal stage. Now I have two trains. If I'm just using automatic block signaling, then I can send this train east, put it in the passing siding, and as it moved down the track and went to the passing siding, all the signals will change accordingly. The problem is, of course, that I've got a westbound train and an eastbound train both sitting here ready to go. Now the dispatcher is where the dispatcher comes in and tells which train can go, which when it starts off. So I need a system that's going to prevent those two trains from colliding into each other. And what the railroad does is basically does is this. Once the train leaves the main line and goes into the intermediate block 3, all of the opposing signals turn to red. So this is all uh, absolute permissive block. When the, when the train gets into the first block here, it recognizes a train coming in from this direction, changes all the opposing signals red. As that train moves down, It'll still be under automatic block signaling. When that train gets here, now these go back to green. We can change that switch, send this train out in this direction, and now when the train coming westbound, all of the eastbound signals will now go red. So what's happening is that the automatic block signaling is overriding I'm sorry, the absolute permissive block signaling is overriding the automatic block signal. Just to well, repeat. It's flipping it all red. Flipping it all red, right. It's, exactly. it's overriding the you know, red, right. yellow, green thing. Yeah. Normally when the train would come in here, they would go one block at a time and switch. When the train hits here in the railroad, it sees that it's in this long stretch of intermediate signals and changes all these signals to red because the train is coming in the opposing direction. So they do that with a whole bunch of relays in the solar cabins. Yeah, uh, they do that with a, with a lot of sophistication, yes. They do that. The cabins all have to be connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Just to emphasize the point you made before, the dispatcher gives orders to the engineer, but he has no control over the lights. Um, he does to a point. Um, I don't think he has control over these lights at the control point. Um, yes, he does. He has, he has some control over the lights at the control point, but these are called the automatic signals, so he doesn't have control over those. As the train comes here from the east, it hits this, and all the westbound signals. Now, we developed a board for this <laughs> to use on your model wide, railroad. Ten feet wide. It's actually it's a very, very simple board. <laughs> the only difference is that the tumble-down board, which is what I call it, uh, you know where the name tumble-down came from? 
this effect used to, used to be able to see this effect out west with the semaphores. And it would stand at one control point, and it would be semaphore after semaphore after semaphore, and a train would come in from the other direction. And all these semaphores would start to fall. The first one would fall, and the second one would fall, and the third one would fall. So all these intermediate signals would go red with semaphores, and it said they were all tumbling down one after each other. That's where that term came from. The difference here between what the real railroad does and what we do is that we don't have a dispatcher, not normally anyway, to tell us when to leave and what train to hold. So I took this one step further and ran circuitry through here to the siding and to the main line. And then ran circuitry here through the siding and through the main line. And the first train that gets to one of these four points will activate the tumble down board. So if the train gets here first and activates it, it'll set all the opposing signals red automatically all the way down the line. So is it one, your signals generally have one board per signal. So Correct. it's another board for each signal? Or yep, this is one board for a whole thing. Could do a whole string. A whole thing. Yep. What it does is simply has uh, inputs for here and inputs for here. So I'm inputting it in. Okay. It had inputs for the intermediate blocks, so that once the tumble-down board determines which way the train's coming from, the intermediate blocks will hold it in that position until it clears out of the intermediate blocks. And then it has uh, no, wires that go out to set the opposing signals red. <laughs> so those are basically three functions. The input, okay, hold by the intermediate blocks, and then set the opposing signals. That's all done with one board. <laughs> As this train moves down the track, okay, this train is coming down here, going in here. Now let's say that you're sitting there and this is a freight, and this is a high-speed passenger, and you want to get that passenger out. Now, on your model railroad, all you have to do is to give this passenger train a clear route to go through. So if I change this switch here to passing siding, which is empty, and change this switch here to the main, which is occupied, now the tumble-down board is going to see this train before it sees that train. So it will reorganize all these signals in the opposing direction. So let's say you have a passing siding at one end of your layout, another passing siding at the other end of the layout. And you want to make sure you don't get two trains coming on a single track in opposing directions. If you put this board on, the signals will tell you which way the switches are set and which train got there first. And you also have the option of changing the switches so that you can send the other train in if you want to send it down. We've had this issue in a couple of shows. Several of us. Where's Tom? <laughs> yeah, he's the one. Just like this. Yeah. You know, we did I don't know if we would have we would have seen the signals red or not, but yeah. We've had this before. More than time. Once yeah. once the train starts into the intermediate area, and the automatic block signaling is holding the opposing signals red here, uh, you'll have absolute you know, the absolute permissive is holding the signals red here. The automatic block signaling will function here. So if you set one train through, you can set a second or even a third down the same line and still separate. That's a lot of information for Sunday morning. Lots of passenger trains priority. Don't they have priority? Is freight have priority? Or passenger cars? Depends on the railroad usually. Yeah. Usually. Usually, well, you know, in the olden days, in the 50s, they gave the passenger cars priority. Mm -hmm. Now they don't care about Amtrak, though. Mm -hmm. usually, usually they have priority. Though, so. Do they? That's on the railroad. But I used to, a lot of guys that were taking the train to work would complain that there was a freight train that had priority from CSX <coughs> and uh, installed the, the, the uh, MTA commuter mm -hmm. or whatever it was. You got called a couple times when I went to Texas. Because of freights? Yeah. Let's take a break. So a uh, question on this. Go ahead. When, like, you know, we're a pretty big club, right? 
and it's really incredible the layout we can set up. A lot of clubs now like a dispatcher that works with these signals. And so they have like one person that does that. And so there are a lot of home layouts where they build the layout with operation as a function of the layout. And with that, they'll have a dispatcher that will work the layout for operating sessions. Uh, comes to mind is uh, Herm Botts out. Uh, well, he's two rail Uska. Uh, he lives up by Keene, New Hampshire. And he has operating sessions. He first used two I think of every month. But it's a big layout. It's a 30 by 60 layout. It's O scale. It's very well But he has the complete signal system plus I built the dispatcher in order for it. So he actually has the dispatcher panel so you can use to see what blocks are occupied in the rail. And they're all communication with headsets and everything like that. So it's a full operation. That's interesting. And these signals eliminated the semaphore? Excuse me? mean these signals eliminated the semaphore? A lot of the different signals eliminated the semaphores because they're mechanical again. So they're trying to get away from mechanical parts. So they have to be serviced so often it's just too much. Anybody else any questions? Let's take a break and get some. Uh...